I'm Malo Hudson. I'm the Dean and Edward E. Elson Professor of the School of Architecture here at UVA. And it is my honor to introduce Andrew Freer, as well as his colleague John Allen from the Rural Studio. And I normally like to be very informal uh, within the A School, despite my uniform I wear every day. Uh, but I do want to read the citation that we provided for Andrew Freer in the Rural Studio. But before I do that, I would say it's always an honor to have our medalists come visit us. And it's particularly an honor when they share our values. And we have had tremendous medalists over the years, as you all know. And so uh, Andrew Freer in, in the Rural Studios fits that bill so well. But I can tell you, spending time, the short amount of time, I feel like uh, I, this is like my brother I never had in so many ways because of his openness, how humble he is, about how he thinks about the world and how he approaches his work. It's very much about what we think about in Campbell Hall and how we live our day-to-day -day lives. And you've heard me say this over and over for those of you who know me as Dean. What's the point of the 21st century university if we're not having impact? Yes, we need to be great in research and scholarship. Yes, we need to be able to teach extremely well. Yes, we need to be able to give service back not only to the university, to our professions, but to the broader community. But at the end of the day, I would say we also need to think about impact. And I can't think of a better uh, group of people to come that really represents having an impact. So let me dive into the formal uh, aspects of the lecture today. So <clears throat> it is my honor to present Andrew Freer, teacher, designer, builder, advocate, and director of Auburn University Rural Studio as the 58th recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medal in Architecture. Wyatt Distinguished Professor Andrew Freer is a champion of the Rural Studio, a hands-on, place-based program that questions the conventional education and role of architects. Rural Studio was founded three decades ago by architect Samuel Mockby and D.K. Ruth and is regarded as one of the oldest, most influential, and well-respected design programs in the world. The program's students live on site and design and build structures for residents and communities in the under-resourced and persistently impoverished rural region in the American South known as the Black Belt. While Freer is a native of Yorkshire, England, and was educated at the Polytechnic of Central London in the Architectural Association, for the last two decades, he has resided over 4,000 miles from where he grew up, living in rural New Bern, Alabama, a town with a population of just under 200 people. There he has provided leadership and taught students as director of Rural Studio and served as a liaison between students, local authorities, community partners, and professional consultants. Working and living alongside neighbors in West Alabama, students have designed and built more than 200 community buildings, homes, parks, across a geographical radius of just 25 miles. The studio's mission is the education of students through experiential and immersive learning methods coupled with research on sustainable and healthful rural living. Projects for Newburn have included the volunteer fire station, a public library, many family homes, and a town hall. The town hall in particular is a building that bears witness to the values that drive the rural studio and that resonates so deeply with us here at the University of Virginia. Freer described this building as giving the town of Newburn a civic heart noting that in places where democracy has been historically fragile, it is especially important to have a center, a defined space, to celebrate it. In part, our admiration of the Rural Studio is based on this sense of rootedness and being confidently situated in a geography and a culture that isn't typically recognized as a site for architectural exploration, but is no less vital a place with, with its own stories, values, and stewards. Andrew Freer and Rural Studio have modeled respectful ways for academic partners to build community resilience by establishing long-term relationships with local municipalities, supporting their endeavors, and helping to create positive experiences within the public realm through design so that these communities can grow and thrive on their own terms. Current research at the Rural Studio focuses on long-term regional sustainability, from home access and affordability, and the efficient use of timber, to small-scale farming and access to clean water. In this context, design research innovation is driven by the practical needs of residents and demonstrates the ways in which 
dignified design can build equity when care is taken into considering, in, in, when considering the complex combination of architectural, social, environmental responsibilities we have as architects and citizens of the world. In their own words, Rural Studio describes that they, cha they challenge students to consider not what can be built, but rather what should be built. Former Greensboro Council member and collaborator Steve Gentry said, it was profound to me that the Rural Studio was so involved in not just building a building, but in building things that made us better. Today, we recognize Andrew Freer's sustained dedication to educating future architects who are deeply committed to fostering thriving communities. On behalf of the School of Architecture, it is my pleasure to welcome Andrew Freer as a 2023 Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medalist in Architecture. Okay. Wow. Um, thanks, pal. That was a, a beautiful invite and introduction. Um, obviously, thank you to the Thomas Jefferson Foundation and also to the University of Virginia. I'm hearing myself twice, am I? Or hello, hello, hello. That's better, is it? Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Jamie and Sneha and Ashley and Saskia for uh, helping organize all of this and putting up with my incessant bad jokes by email. And uh, um, also to Melissa, who's sitting up there. Uh, I had a great visit at the Fab Lab yesterday. Um, we've, she's actually agreed to donate the majority of the equipment to the Rural Studio, so I'm, I'm <laughs> delighted. You didn't know that, but that was, that was over a couple of beers last night. So. Um, uh, but also, um, and they've all been poo-pooing it today, but I think it's, it's as, you know, given the roll call of folks that have won this award previously, it's quite uh, intimidating, and there's a sort of, a, I think, a, a kind of general imposter syndrome feeling at the Rural Studio about uh, our name, name being alongside all those, those kind of greats of our profession. So, uh, I, wow, so thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, don't really know how to, are you sure it's not a mistake? Because you can take it back right now. I've still got it in the car if you want it back. So. Um, but we're also um, very happy to use the award, the award as a kind of uh, a general kind of shout out for the rural um, and to kind of raise the issues of, of rural injustice relative to the urban condition. I think we should all be looking and thinking about rural and urban conditions as a symbiotic relationship, not as a kind of a... Um, uh, a, a kind of an extraction condition. Um, and I think we also would be kind of folks that would say that um, good design should be for everybody anywhere. Um, again, that, that design should not just be for cities, but perhaps can be kind of for the rural as well. And, um, and that also shouldn't matter your, your income or your wealth, quite frankly. Everybody builds good design. And, and also to say that housing does matter. Um, our country, your country, is in a kind of a, a, a massive, quite frankly, disaster at the moment in the, 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 the amount of housing need that exists out there. It really should be um, on the political consciousness, and it's a shame that it isn't because it is so important to have dignified and affordable housing for everybody. And I think that we would want to be shouting out for that. I mean, I don't know if you all know this, but there, it, it seems to be like a basic human right to have a parking space. You Americans have eight parking spaces per car in the United States, but you don't have the right to good, decent housing. And it seems that's perverse to me. So. You all, as you, you know, young lady at the front, as you grow up, you should be shouting about housing for everybody because it's really important. Um, I, um, I, I think, I hope today, uh, the uh, next year is our 30th anniversary. Good God, the Rural Studio has been around 30 years. Um, I've been around for 23 of them. Um, 
Obviously, with my silly accent, I'm kind of an insider and an outsider and an insider. Uh, I can get away with saying some things that you Americans can't. Um, but I hope that I bring a perspective to the work tonight that maybe isn't seen in the magazines and the books. Um, I hope to show you the process that we're involved with at the Rural Studio. Um, to say a few things, I think you all should understand that most of the work that you, you see tonight is, is made and built by, and designed and built by folks that are between the age of 18 and 23 year old, three years old, and we're simply the handholders there. So young folks can kind of start to practice what they can, what they will practice what they will practice, if you like. Um, I think we've also become, in some respects, the town architect for the county and for that 25 mile radius. Uh, we've done that by staying in one place for 29 years, getting to know people, getting to make, getting to kind of, I hope really know people, which you, you never do, but I, I don't know, most architects will go to another place and build something and then leave, or, um, uh, you know, architecture programs often will go off to other countries and build something. And I think the question for me is, with, with anybody practicing as an architect, how do you know if you've actually done what you were trying to do? Have you achieved anything with it? Or was it, was it a, a massive failure? Or, or did it work out well? And in Hale County and in our situation, we're surrounded by our work. And of course, if we do okay, we don't hear anything about it. But you know, if we screw up, you can definitely, you, you should know we hear about it. So um, I think uh, as, as the dean said, uh, we, 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 ask, we have the luxury of asking some ethical questions. Uh, this question of what, you know, very much a school of architecture, and it, it is and should be about what, what can we build, but I think we like to overlay that with what should we build. Um, and I think what we do try to do is take responsibility for our successes and our failures because we're a member of that community that we're building for. And, we do ask the students, we, we really say one thing to the students at the beginning of the year. We, uh, we ask them to just leave the place just a little bit more than, bit better than they found it. They're kind of borrowing the place, and that, that's not, they don't have, we, we don't want them to come and preach, we don't want them to come and save the world, we don't want folks to be told how they should live their lives, but just try to leave it an incy bit, incy wincy bit better. That's much better, thank you, whoever did that. Um, um, I hope also uh, all of the projects that you'll see tonight are actually, uh, it's all teamwork, so that we, in, in a sense, we practice what they, they practice what they will practice. It's not individuals, we're, everything we do is team, and us as teachers are part of that team. Um, I hope tonight you will see a kind of very positive critique of how we teach, procure, and make architecture. It's pretty amazing what 18-year-old folks can, can do if they're given the opportunity. Um, and I hope that I uh, kind, of, kind of convey the kind of pure, unadulterated joy in the act of creating and making and designing, because it, it's what you all are doing should be fun, and we find it fun, and we laugh at the place and ourselves all the time, and we laugh at each other all the time. Um, last thing I would pray for that you all do, is that you laugh at my jokes as well tonight, or it's gonna be a really fucking long evening, okay? Uh, oh, they are alive out there, that's good. Um, uh, before I get on with this, um, I do, as, as uh, the boss down here suggested, John Allen is, in the, is up front here. Give John Allen a, a big round of applause. He is... Uh... I, okay. Not, not, not too much, you've got to keep him in his place, right? He's, uh, he's our head of operations, and uh, he basically does all of the shit that I don't want to do, and allows me to waltz around the world and act like a diva, like I do. So thank you much, John. And the other person I want to acknowledge is my beautiful girlfriend over here, Emily Newstrom, and this is a, uh, an unabashed, unashamed advertisement. You all, by the time you leave tonight, I, you can stop listening to the lecture. I need you to go on Apple or on Spotify. Check out Emily Newstrom. Uh, just launched uh, an album called uh, No More Jambalaya, and it, it is fantastic, okay? 
and uh, you'll need to buy it. And uh, even better, go and see her uh, in uh, Festival International at Lafayette or in the Blues Festival in Biloxi in the next few weeks, because she's super. I'm biased, but, uh, and I'm done for tonight. Thank you very much. I'm going. Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 uh, unashamed. So uh, for the rest of this, it's like, why let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? So, OK, uh, yeah, please get on with it. So um, I come to you, not exactly today, but a couple of days ago from this place. This is New Bern, uh, as, as, as the boss said. Um, it's about a town of 178 people within in the city limits. Um, it, just for a geography lesson for you all, because I know you're like, oh, Alabama. Oof, where's Alabama? Well, Alabama's here where the Red Cross is, predictably. Um, uh, we're at the bottom end of the Appalachian Mountain Trail, and um, we're in the place known as the Deep South. But don't, re don't believe all the stories you hear about Al Alabama. We're also in a place called the Black Belt, and um, the Black Belt is... Uh, it's a kind of an extension of the Appalachians, and it, it propagated this beautiful black soil. It's not because there was a whole bunch of black folks lived there, but it was this beautiful black soil that also, of course, propagated cotton. Um, unfortunately, most of that, that soil has kind of either been dissipated uh, by uh, over, over farming or, or just literally has washed away. Um, and it's left us with this kind of expansive red clay that I'll tell you about a little bit later. So we, um, we work, I need a stick, we work in the kind of civil rights triangle of Birmingham, Selma, Montgomery. The university's on the east side and Raw Studios on the west side. So that's, that's a deliberate strategy to keep away from like grown-ups like him so we can make a mess and they call up and say, we're going to be four hours. So we all scamper around tidying the shit up in four hours. Um, so uh, no, it's, I, you know, we live with this, con I mean, the, what happened in the 60s is so recent in this area that we live with it every day of our lives. And it, uh, it's very much of our part, part of our history and our everyday and you can't, you can't avoid it, and we don't want to avoid it, but we're kind of also proud of it, that um, much of what happened had its roots in the rural condition, and it was brought to the urban condition. And I think we're very proud of that history. Um, so just to say, I uh, have a little bit of a shout out for the rural. There is a kind of common misconception that the rural is dying. It's actually not true. Um, certainly the urban condition has, you know, done this, but the rural condition for about the last 120 years has pretty much remained the same about, so it's about 60 million people. So that's a lot of folks, right? Which is about the size of Italy, honestly. So to always kind of question that myth that rural is dying, because it isn't. It's just, it has just not kept pace with the urban condition, and, and for lots of good reasons. Um, one of the things that you should also think about is that the, the, uh, the rural condition has, I think, in the United States particularly, has been treated as something of an extraction landscape. I think the attitude towards it has been very much as a, almost like a colony. We will take from it and we will give very little back. And the consequences are very clear when you look at this poverty map, whether it's through the Mississippi Delta, through the Appalachians or the Colonias, that's where the deepest levels of poverty are, and that is not a coincidence that those places are pretty much where extraction has taken place and little is given back. And you look at this and it's really, it's stunning. It's, it's really important. It doesn't take a, a fellow with a stupid accent to kind of get annoyed about this, but in, 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 in West Alabama, literally 15 miles from where I live, uh, in Marion, Alabama, in Perry County, there are kids in, in poverty, of, uh, the, the level of kids in poverty is like 70 to 80% of, the, of, of kids growing up. And that is just shocking, right, in this country. I mean, Marion, Alabama, where Coretta Scott King was born, this is, this is allowed to happen. I mean, what the fuck, you know? So we, we, we should care about these things. Um, anyway, uh, enough of my rant, but it, it annoys me. Um, the other thing is that I think 
there, there, I think if there was a leveling of resources, again, if, the, if, it, if it was understood as a symbiotic relationship between the urban and the rural, I think there would be much more equity. This is um, one of those, uh, I, this is obviously, as it says, an internet provider competition map. Well, what I like about it most is it states kind of, you know, it's, it's proudly states that my internet service in New Bern, Alabama is 1,140% slower than the national average. Well, what do you do? Um, but that, that's a problem, relative, you know, relative to getting medical help, you name it, connecting with society, having a discourse with society. This, this is no good, right? And we need to do something about this, because people could live in these places, and particularly you started to see it during the pandemic, if something as simple as broadband was brought to these regions, it would have a huge change for the way that people live their lives. So this is what we look like. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of young folks with, I used to have a little bit more color in my hair at the back. Um, and we t we're an undergraduate program of the School of Architecture at Auburn. Uh, I think we're proud to be a part of a, a, a land-grant institution doing work in our backyard. And uh, the majority of our kids come this from the southeast, and uh, they're kind of proud to come to the rural studio and be doing that work. Um, we do, there's, there's only one real rule. Uh, the ladies are the only ones in charge of the heavy equipment, because they are by far away the most sensible. Isn't that correct? Yeah. He knows. He was kicked off. Um, but we also, we, we, we learn by doing when we learn in teams, okay? And there's, uh, it, in this kind of landscape, particularly the kind of farmerly nature of the place, they make do with what they have around them. And there isn't, there's not a fear working in this place that I find, in, you know, lit, lit, it's not a litigious place. It certainly isn't litigious at the moment, right? Um, this is downtown New Bern, uh, three fragile institutions, the School of Architecture. That's a proper School of Architecture. Uh, the, the, fi uh, the, the, the post office and the New, New Bern Mercantile. So this is a School of Architecture. You've really got to fucking love what you do to be at this School of Architecture. Um, uh, and we just say, well, this is, this is an environmental study for you all, you know? You uh, put your clothes on in winter and you take your clothes off in summer, all right? So. My dean would hate the fact that I'm showing this. And John's like, God damn, you're showing them that. Um, but we, we took this building because it's in the heart, heart of downtown New Bern. It's the center of our community. We have events like this, which is Hall Halloween pumpkin carving. We get local kids involved. And it's just a, it's a, it's a way to take us out of our ivory tower, which was really the original mission of the Royal Studio. Get out there, meet people, get to know ordinary people. Um, we also have strange events like uh, the Halloween costume contest, um, where we all get dressed up, and, uh, and then we have a serious conversation about architecture. So, so this, is, this is three public toilets talking about uh, a really serious house project. So, um, and then I've suddenly realized that I'm probably the only medalist ever to show up as dressed as a nun, right? Uh, <laughs> Um, point being is we, uh, we, we like to take the work, I think that we take the work very seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. And I think that's really important for architects particularly. Social humility. Um, so we have uh, consultants from all over the planet helping us that have kind of been attracted to the can-do at, uh, atmosphere at the Royal Studio. This is a guy called Anderson Inge, a Texan who now works in London. He comes and do these kind of fantastic uh, structural exercises where you test something to destruction. And it's really intuitive understanding of why uh, structures fail. And even, you know, in our 20th anniversary nine years ago, we had rock stars like um, Glenn Merkert show up. He should, he should give Glenn a medal. He's, 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 he's a real rock star. Um, he always said, he came and he said, don't wrap your legs around a good idea because it will get in the way of a better idea. And I'm like, you're right on, pal. So, um, And then this is the rest of downtown, uh, the post office that has been reduced to, you know, four inconvenient hours a day, I think in the kind of hope that it might fail. But 
we send enormous amounts of mail out of there to keep sustaining it. And this is Beyonce, uh, my girlfriend, my other girlfriend. Um, uh, yeah, she, it was her birthday that day, so I thought I'd show her that. Um, and then this is the mercantile, uh, the rest of downtown. This is GB Woods, who retired after 39 years and 10 months. Um, we were worried that we were going to lose the place, but thankfully there's a couple of other families have taken it o over and are doing short order cooking there. Um, but again, there's kind of fragility, and these are the places where you meet people in this community, and they're really important. And of course, you can buy, you know, enhance your diet with cold 45 and orange juice. So. Um, we're in uh, more and more in Tornado Alley. I keep unfortunately saying we're, we keep dodging a bullet. Um, if any of you know Selma, 45 minutes from us, Selma was really nailed recently, and it's kind of tragic. Um, so we probably know more about the weather than any other architecture program or architecture students in the world, because it's like, we need to build stuff, and it gets in our way. Um, locally, uh, a lot of people commute to service sector industries, but we're, um, we do kind of, at the moment, are relying, the, the farmers are diversifying, relying particularly on beef herds. The other thing that they've discovered is if you, uh, if you dig a hole, and maybe if you eat catfish in this area, it's likely to have come from Hale County. They realize that if they dig a hole in this expansive red clay, which incidentally is terrible to build on, but if you dig a hole and you supersaturate that hole with water and just let it soak around it, it sort of self-seals it. So it's a really cheap way of, of, of um, uh, raising catfish and making a pond. So the farmers diversify, and you'll often see these left to be fallow and the cows are back in there. So, um, also, you know, uh, surrounded by our very checkered history, but there are also, you know, uh, you know, the 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 origins of these buildings and who made them, of course, is kind of is not something that we celebrate. But we also do acknowledge that these are timber buildings that have lasted 150 years, and what can we learn from them? Because they have fantastic cron ventilation, tall ceilings all of the, the things that we have forgotten as a society. We all expect to just remotely switch it from, it's got, so I'm, I'm at 69 degrees in summer and I'm at 69 degrees in winter, and we just expect that, and it's ridiculous. And it is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a it, you know, we're gonna have a shit fest at some point. So, uh, you know, there are things to learn from this. Narrow plans, Again, cross ventilation is so important, and we're also a big a believer in porches. So, and also learning from the farm vernacular. Um, and beautiful, this was this was built by slave carpenters on a plantation near us. But as a piece of architecture, it's like it's almost it's quite breathtaking as a piece of timber building raised off the ground to protect it with a big umbrella. Right, just spectacular. You can. You also kind of, with that central opening, it, you have a sense that that was kind of African in origins. This little seed house in a place called Folsom near us. So, as was said, our work's in about a 25 mile radius um, of Newburn. Really, that's to help us manage it. Um, started out with uh, working in a place called Mason's Bend, which was very much uh, uh, a little community of former slaves. Uh, this was for um, Alberta and Shepherd Bryant, great southern porch. And this was under Samuel Mockby, and you can see, excuse me, this is not the project built, designed by 18 to 22-year-olds. This has a 57-year-old Mississippian's hands all over it. I mean, he could, uh, he, he was quite extraordinary, but his kind of sensibility for the vernacular and kind of tweaking the vernacular was amazing. So we started out very much underneath the radar doing relatively idiosyncratic homes. This was, this was a house that we built out of 70,000 hand stacked carpet tiles, um, uh, sponsored by Interface. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I probably today I wouldn't be building something like this, but when we got into it, we, we talked to Interface. The carpet tiles has actually been held in storage for uh, seven years, they hadn't, they'd never been used, and they said they've off-gassed, so you don't need to worry about them. And the remarkable thing is that 
the wood around the beams has all deteriorated, but the carpet tiles are still in fantastic shape. And it's, it's, um, it's really a, a, a kind of fantastic acoustic wall and thermally really good. So I don't, I don't apologize for it, because you know, at the end of the day, it, this family, uh, they, they were living in two rooms. They were living in a two-room house. And for AJ, the, the kid on the left, it completely changed his life to have his own bedroom. And for Lucy, Lucy is the proudest gal in the world. She's like, she wants every, all comers to come and see her home because she's like, I'm the only person in the world that's got a house built of carpet tiles. Yo, come on down and see it. So, you know, there's, there's pride in that. And, uh, but I don't know whether we do that today for, for a variety of reasons, right? Um, so we, I think we started to ask questions about whether or not young students should be building you know, out of idiosyncratic materials, and maybe we could also be creative just simply using sticks. And uh, I think we started to think we can, we've proved that. Uh, this was a beautiful house that we did for a, a lady called Rosalie Turner. Uh, this was the, what we call the expandable courtyard house. Um, we built the kind of the, um, the machine for living in the, fir uh, in the first phase built a room for uh, two rooms for her, her sons, and then built this courtyard, and all out of uh, hand-milled cypress from cypress trees, and, uh, and then scavenged all of the interior materials from a local farm, from a local barn. And this is, this is the beautiful Rosalie, em, you know, emblazoned in her fabulous pink dress. And there she is. She was a kind of neighborhood watch, one-man neighborhood watch, one-gal neighborhood watch, if you like. On her, on her front porch, which again kind of celebrates the kind of public nature of a, of a porch. We also started to do, uh, it started to, in the late 90s, in the last century, we started to do um, smaller public projects. This was a little uh, community center come chapel called the Mason's Bend Glass Chapel. This is actually, uh, Chevrolet Caprice windows on top of a metal frame that sits on top of a round earth wall. Here's the kids, they drove up to um, Chicago to, to rob the local, the, 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 the wrecking yards of the, these windows. And the, the nice thing about the windows was that they actually had a pre-drilled hole in them, in that, in that glass, so they were able to attach it to uh, a frame. Uh, some of you in the room will probably remember, like in the late 90s, every architecture school, every student was doing like a fishkin project. So I think this was Rural Studio getting his fishkin project out of it, you know. But a beautiful little space, um, always a troubling project for us in of recent times because it, as a kind of community building, it was never able to be secured, and so the kids would kind of trash it. And, and you know graffiti in it, not really trying to kind of damage it, but just they would use it, right? But then you all would come and visit us and go, well, don't you? Don't the community care about this project? And so you you kind of learn lessons about that. That there's like, you know, be careful with that kind of condition because you might unknowingly produce a real problem. Um, these uh, three muscular guys, they took. 700 tires from uh, uh, a, a tire repair place in Selma who was threatened with prosecution. He, he gave us the 700 tires. These fellas filled them full of rammed earth and then filled, covered them with pink concrete. And they scavenged a beautiful barn structure to sit on top of this. And this, this over is on the edge of a ravine. And uh, at the time, this got a lot of publicity. And it's, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture, I think, in this country. And it's, it's such a shame, because unfortunately, it was done for a private client, and they, they passed away, and they gave it to a family who doesn't want anyone to go and see it anymore. So it's, you know, when you start, you kind of, you, you, uh, you make associations that you, you need to become lessons, right? Um, but it's an amazing, you know, this is the kind of, the pulpit is, is hanging out over the ravine here. So the, the preacher will stand out in the ravine and, and kind of preach back. So, um, so when I showed up I, I, in Hale County, it's really not an exaggeration. I, I witnessed shacks with dirt floors. And uh, 
what has happened basically over the last 23 years is they've been replaced by these things, which I don't really honestly know that they're any better, quite frankly, because they're, um, they're in some respects, financial genius. Uh, people can get these homes, in, in a sense, they're treated like an automobile. You can get these homes and purchase them like an automobile, uh, but they're not real property. They're actually chattel property. And that's a really big issue, that people think they're investing in a home, and they're actually investi investing in something that lasts, has a lifespan not much longer than an automobile. And uh, so Rural Studio started to ask a question about this, you know, and this was in 2000, you know, 2005. Well, you know, if we wanted to provide an alternative to a trailer home, how much would it cost and who would it be for? And we, you know, at that time we said, well, you know, what could the average person on social or income support actually afford? And we actually came up with a number of about $100 a month in a mortgage, whether it's in rent or mortgage. And then we said, well, what happens if uh, that, again, is paid into a mortgage? And that would look something like a $20,000 mortgage. Now, of course, whether or not the banks will give you a $20,000 mortgage, a whole other problem, but we said, the poorest of the poor or people on income support, what is it that they could afford? And so our goal at that time was to say, can it become a, uh, a small economy of home building? And, and how much what does that mean that the builder would need and how much would the materials be? And we started to kind of project what kind of economic impact that would have in a place if you started to do that, which could be considerable and could be huge, right? So since then, we, the, the studio has been doing one or two models every year. Uh, we started with one bedrooms. We've got a number of them that we really liked and that were really successful. They're not deliberately rural vernacular, um, but they ended up being a, a, of a kind of vernacular form. So this is, to all intent, this is Dave's home. All our homes are named after the initial recipients. This is Dave. Uh, it's actually essentially similar to a shotgun house where there's an entrance at the front, an entrance at the back, and as they would say, you could shoot a gun all the way through it, right? Um, the reason that it is this dimension is simply this is the kind of dimension that timber will span, or certainly could span in those days, sitting on two piers. This is 14 feet wide, right? So it was not, this was all about how do you, how, how to, how to use, uh, make a form out of, really, uh, you know, uh, working with material efficiency. How do you bring somebody some dignity? How do you give them a, host, a home that's livable in without air conditioning? So tall ceilings, good cross ventilation. We allowed ourselves two doors and five windows, and you've got to be really precise about that, and a porch. Max followed that as a kind of side entrance, living on one side, sleeping on the other. Uh, again, not rocket science, but you know nobody else is looking at this as an issue, and and it's again, it, it's these are really important issues to take on, and we actually thought that the students would get bored with this, and actually they've really taken off with it, and they're enjoying the challenge of making something out of very little. This was a square house that we did for Joanne's. It kind of proved the point that if you have the same perimeter footage of uh, exterior footage uh, in, a, in a circle or a square form, you actually have a larger square footage internally. So Joanne's is actually bigger simply because it's more of a square than the other two were. The, this is, I think we like this scheme because there's a kind of very clear differentiation between the living space and the sleeping space. And this is a kind of the view sitting out, and there's Joanne on the front porch. So. So the studio has taken these, um, we live with them, our, our friends around us live in them, and we also started to realize that we weren't building actually much adaptability and flexibility into this housing. Because in a rural condition, people get a home and they get it for life. They don't get it to flip it. So you've really got to think about multi-generations living in these homes. So even with this one, which is Joanne's home, through a very simple changing of where the back door was and putting a day bed in the front room. Ophelia calls her house a two bedroom house because she's got a day bed in the front room that she lives, that she sleeps on and her son lives in the back room. And that, that little house now enables two people to live in there and he can come and go as he wishes and it's 
totally changed the kind of conceptually what that house was doing, right? So just, and, and then we also looked around ourselves and understood how houses had evolved over years and what was causing them to fail. So this was uh, 1961, a home for Miss Patrick, started out as a single room house next to the railroad line. Uh, her f grandfather came and lived in New Bern, worked on the railroad line, and then they just kept expanding. But guess what the problem is when you keep adding on? Foundations are all different, they all move. You've got low pitches of roofs meeting each other, so they all tend to kind of fail at these moments where they literally just pull themselves apart. So we started to ask ourselves, how do we make our houses more adaptable? This is one example. This is uh, the idea of using a big pole barn over smaller volumes. So we, this is Reggie. Uh, we gave Reggie a small living unit here in what we call the bonus room here. So we invest, we're getting, encouraging Res, Reggie to invest in the slab and the roof structure and not touch it. And so that's precious. We even pulled the slab away from the column, gave him this small unit here that is for him, and then a bonus room here that is also, it's plumbed out, but it's not finished inside. And the idea is that down the road, if Reggie, if, if Reggie pulls this volume forward and that other volume back, he can actually build himself a five bedroom house under this. So, and, it, and it's a little, it, A, it keeps you out of the rain if you're building something, and it's also a little bit more forgiving if folks are not the greatest of carpenters. So um, that's Reggie's house. Reggie loves it, the old fireplace from the house that we tore down. Um, the other question was, could we uh, be smarter with uh, internal expansion? Instead of adding on, could we say, can we offer up a house that has more adaptability internally? And so we started doing studies of what we imagined, you know, a couple with a, uh, and then getting a child, and then a couple, you know, moving on, aging, bringing camp parents in, et cetera, et cetera. And what would that mean kind of spatially for a house? So we, we actually ended up coming up with a house that uh, could either be a two-bedroom house or a five-bedroom house, just depending on whether or not you built one bedroom over here, you could end up building two bedrooms at one end, two at either side of the kind of the fixed part of the house, which was the staircase, kitchen, and bathroom, or even three downstairs using the, the second entrance as a way into that bedroom. So you still got a main entrance into the whole space. So uh, these are the kinds of drawings that our teams do. Uh, we use lots of, what, of large models to get them to think about how to frame up the buildings, and then they sequence that, and then an awful lot of one-to-one -one drawings that a lot of visitors just come in and start drawing all over them. And we, we're really proud of drawing by hand, because if you draw on the computer, those lines merge with each other. You all know this when you're drawing sections, but if you have to draw it by hand, it, you can actually identify those two two by sixes next to each other, and it starts to feel much more real. So a lot, I think all of our projects, we're thinking about the fact that we are gonna be building these, and that's a kind of a challenge from day one. So this is, this is the Myers house going up. We had kind of figured out that the footprint of the two bedroom house because we were starting to do slab on grade, we could actually load it up with a little bit more space and a little bit more weight, so we put an attic truss up there, and in this particular case, we, gave, we left it as an unfinished space upstairs that they, had, they could have two bedrooms upstairs when their kids inherit it. So um, the Myers family, the elderly folks are living in it now, and, and their daughter's gonna take it over and we'll transform this and finish it out. So this is downstairs as it is. There's Margie Myers. Um, and their grandkids, because she's kind of running a daycare there as well for all the grandkids, right? Um, so there, I, I think for me the amazing thing that's come of this is that uh, four years ago, uh, Fannie Mae approached us and said, we don't have any uh, models for our um, rural mortgages, and, and, I, and it, was, it was like, Are you, is this really Fannie Mae? Are you joking? You're coming to a podunk little program in the middle of Alabama and asking us for our, our, our model homes. And they said, yes, we, we would like to work with you all. So for the last four to five years, they've actually sponsored us. We've grown a, a, an initiative called the Front Porch Initiative. And we, we now have eight partners across the Southeast who are building homes. Uh, sorry, eight states, 
16 partners across the southeast. So we're taking the projects that we started in Newburn and those prototypes, we've got a team that's taking them up to a different level of uh, uh, thermal comfort because we've also realized that um, if we can help these not-for-profits predict what the, uh, the energy bills will be for their buildings, instead of paying those bills down the road, they can actually put that money into the upfront mortgage for a house. So that's been quite a shock to us. Um, we're also doing a lot of work in urban conditions, like this one in Nashville, where they changed the ordinance locally so we could put four small units on a bigger piece of property. Um, in, in the main, what was great about it, you know, as a kind of an aside, is that because of the sloping nature of the ground, it didn't actually really have great value locally. So for the not-for-profit, what it has changed the game is suddenly if you can put smaller units on it, it actually raises the land value for the not-for-profit. So, um, and this is the, you know, what's wonderful from our point of view is that the, that feedback loop of local contractors, not-for-profits building these homes and we get the information back to us on the ground in Newburn. Not just a bunch of academics kind of trying things. So really proud of it. And I, I have goosebumps thinking about this. But we're, we're a, kind of a, a kind of a catalyst for a conversation about rural housing right at this moment. Um, and I think what, you know, most importantly, the house is actually the, the kind of the, the minor part of the conversation. It's the easy part. It's the kind of systemic issues that are much more difficult. How people get access to loans, how they prove ownership of property through air property issues, you can't believe it. The architecture is just this little bit of the kind of giant mess that we're getting into. So uh, that says something about it, but I'll keep going. So. Um, uh, really since 2000, the studio get, uh, got asked to kind of get more involved by the local municipalities in uh, community projects. Uh, this was 2004, this was Newburn Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, we do OSHA training at the Rural Studio, and uh, this is our kind of safety equipment for all of the teams. Thankfully, some of you are still awake. Um, uh, and, you know, working with real clients and real, real people who can't read architectural drawings, they can't speak archi-speak, and uh, you've, got to pretend, you've got to kind of imagine you're talking to your mom about something, and why would she like it, and what would she get out of it? So this was the first public building in Newburn for 100 years. It was celebrating the, the, the kind of evolving nature of the Newburn Volunteer Fire Department. They were able to get fire trucks to, ironically enough, fight bushfires, but they also were uh, trucks that take water to the site. In rural areas, we don't have any uh, fire hose, what are they called? Um, hydrants, yeah. So um, they needed a building, you know, like, to guarantee the grant, they needed to produce a building that would stop the, the trucks freezing. So you can see the great southern wall of polygal and, and cedar slats. Um, this was actually at the opening. Uh, tremendous thing for our community. Black folks, white folks, Mennonites, everybody was involved with this. You can see that great southern wall of polygal with the slats that top, stop the summer sun coming in but let the, the low winter sun in. The concrete slab that uh, acts as a big thermal mass and their big, their proud Newburn fire truck in the front. Um, the building was supposed to be town hall as well but the lazy buggers that they were, they, wouldn't, they would end up having their meetings in these side aisles, they wouldn't move the trucks out, and in the height of summer and the depths of winter, it was like, it was just a little bit too cold, a little bit too hot for democracy. So uh, the, the mayor came to us and said, can we get involved with the, with the town hall? Luckily, all of this property was owned by the town. When they cleared the land for the fire department, there was obviously some tree huggers in the, in the fire department who, said, who stopped them tearing the trees down. So we simply suggested that there was kind of a little brother built next to the Big Shoulders firehouse. And uh, so this is the town hall. It's built of eight inch by si eight inch cypress logs, milled from a, a swamp in North Alabama. This is the student team dressing them. 
and they're literally just stacked on one on top of each other with threaded rods coming through them, just like Lincoln logs. So the beauty of it is, and this is typical, every project has to do a full-scale mock-up. Uh, in this case, we did the large opening because structurally our engineer was concerned about uh, this, ab the ability to span this. And uh, so this is actually cambered just a little bit, and then we loaded it up to IBC and, and, and measured the deflection on this when we put all the muscles on top of it. So um, uh, a lot of mock-ups we do at the studio to test things. This was probably the biggest meeting we ever had at the town hall, which was about the reducing of hours of the post office. But you can see the, the, um, the walls are made of eight inch by eight inch rugs, and you can see it. So it's not layers of stuff that's kind of thin and temporary. This is material that's from around us, and you know what it is when you see it, right? So the big challenge of the project was understanding that the building would actually shrink three and a half inches over its nine foot height. So what we ended up having to do was mount the windows on the outside face so that they could, you know, if you put a window in the opening and it, and it shrinks, what's going to happen to the glass? So we mounted it on the outside, the windows, which is beautiful because it means that you can actually see the eight inch by eight inch cypress logs for what they are. And then, uh, so there's the view, this is the council chamber, and uh, here's the view to downtown New Bern and the, to the mercantile. So we were able, we, even when we were building this building, we pulled some tables out onto the site and framed up these openings and said, Mr. Mayor, come and sit here. Is this the view that you want? So, um, so these gals were bugging me for about four years to, to help them with a library in New Bern. Uh, three of them were school teachers. Um, uh, thankfully, we all have gray hair, uh, which was nice. Um, and this, uh, this was the old bank that was closed in the 1920s, a very loved building. Uh, and I think the, locally they were a bit nervous about, you know, the rural studio doing something wacky with it. Uh, we decided not to do that, uh, put an awning on the front, uh, celebrated the bank vault with the bank vault door, pulled the bank vault door to the front, took all of the bricks from the bank vault. And what we, what we also found in, in looking at this building was there was a crawl space underneath it, and the two roads around it were higher than the crawl space. So we opened up the floor originally and found a, a pond underneath it. So we, and, and the bank vault itself was wicking water up into the space. So the last thing you want in a library is humidity. So, so we took all the bricks down and uh, you'll see what they became. But this is, this is the kind of celebrating books and celebrating reading, the big kind of reading space, getting everybody together. And then there's these small nooks. Uh, this is the kids' nook. And then this is the garden nook, using some of the materials from the old bank. And then the courtyard is made from all of the bricks that we just literally stacked on top of each other to make this kind of lovely outdoor space. The main impact it's had on Newburn is bringing broadband into the town. So that's been a really big deal. And the after-school programs, because they also, the, the year it was finished, ironically, they closed our local school, so all the kids are bust now. But, uh, so we work with remarkable people. I mean, those gals at the library are extraordinary people, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go teach, and then coming and sitting about and talking about the future of their library at 7 o'clock at night. And that just gives me goosebumps to work with those folks. This is uh, Teresa Burroughs. Uh, she hid Dr. King from the Ku Klux Klan two weeks before he was assassinated. Uh, she owned this house. King was hidden in this room. They were given this building, and she decided to open uh, a, a kind of a, a, a small museum to kind of monumentalize that day, but also to monumentalize the, the, uh, the foot soldiers that she called them in the, in the rural movement. Um, so we took this building, this is how it existed, uh, and we, stre we basically stretched one side of it and extended the, 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 the right-hand side. We, we refinished the front two buildings and just extruded them. We made a very democratically ac accessible sloping ramp into the back door, and then this, kind of, this courtyard space with a glass connector. Because Teresa said, I need you to make this building so it has one entrance and can be controlled by one person. I'm going to die. It needs to have, you know, 
didactic panels, self-guided panels, and we also need a space for local artists to come and exhibit because people will only visit this place one time. So I need something that will change to attract them back. So really smart, really clear, very honest. Um, this is, uh, we fritted the glass on, on the west side. Uh, all of these are local folks who are involved in the march to, from Selma to Montgomery. So we kind of monumentalized that. And then we found, we took off some of the drywall and found these beautiful boards inside and said, Teresa and the board, do you all like this? Because we think it's beautiful, but we didn't want to patronize them with it was like, you know, one man's art is another one's trash. It's like, you don't, you don't patronize folks. But they were like, yeah, this is spectacular. So really all we did was trimmed it out and sealed it. So you can see how, what a lovely space this makes as a little community space. And then the students made didactic panels um, as a self-guided tour for the space. Uh, it's, it's really difficult. The spaces are so small, but there's also these amazing mugshots of people from all the locals that were arrested for marching. And you get folks going in, kids going in there going, that's, that's my grandma. I didn't know she was arrested. And they were all, like, people didn't tell their kids and their siblings that they were arrested because they were embarrassed about it. Like, God damn, you know? Um, so, um, and then this is that extruded, extruded space with the, uh, as an art gallery. So we put uh, a, a, a heated floor in there and took the roof up all the way to the gable to kind of show the difference between the two spaces. Here's Teresa. Here's some of the foot soldiers, our team of four. Uh, Chris, the three C's, actually team of three. Chris, Cassandra, and uh, three C's. Chris, Cassandra. Shit, I can't remember, I'll tell you. Um, but just an amazing day, honestly. And we have these ribbon cutting ceremonies. So started doing uh, projects that were phase projects. This was a project in an amazing place that had, had a kind of beautiful cypress swamp. It, uh, it had been a park during the Works Project Administration. They closed it in the 70s. The local politician came to me and said, reopen the park, will you? And we'd like to build all these projects. And he said, I want you to do a pavilion first. So, because he wanted to get the pavilion on the front page of the local newspaper. So, so we did this pavilion, which kind of is beautiful because it, it bounces the dapple light onto the ceiling. Uh, this, is, this is what we call the cedar pavilion. And then these kids, uh, well, team, sorry, these team of incredible students, uh, they were, the mayor liked the project so much that he said, don't do prefabricated restrooms. We want, Three, we want three remarkable restrooms. So these, these, this team took on the challenge of three remarkable restrooms. They built a walkway through the forest to the pavilion while they were doing the restrooms. And then I think they produced the three most remarkable pooping experiences in the United States of America. So, so this is the tall toilet, the mound toilet, and the long toilet. It's all this kind of English potty humor, as you can imagine. So this is the view from the John sitting, looking out in the tall toilet. Uh, this is the long toilet. Uh, this is where a boss guy can sit on the toilet and talk to the tree because nobody else will listen to him, right? <laughs> and then this is the mound toilet where you can sit in the, and look through the horizontal slot and sit on the john and shoot the deer as they go across the fire lane. So, um, and at that point, we ran out, the, the, the community had run out of money, but they said, we wanted to do a 100-foot birding tower and we said, well, to get to the, where you want the birding tower, we need to build a bridge. So we built this kind of Toblerone bridge uh, where the Toblerone section, the, the walking trail hung from the Toblerone section. So here it is structurally. So here's a load coming down here, tie downs at the end, and then you put the center section in last. So it's like dropping in the center section of the St. Louis Arch. And uh, these are the kinds of drawings that we do for all of our uh, fabricators, different kind of shop drawings that we do. So our kids work through with an awful lot of consultants and local fabricators. We built the trusses in the parking lot at the top and then ingeniously we put a trailer axle halfway down the truss and a towing hitch on the other end. And then that's me actually helping. This truss was, you know, pushed to within an inch of its life bouncing down the road. And we were holding onto this strap to stop it bouncing. And then we got a crane from Crane Works donated for the weekend, and they lift the three 
two sections, and there's Jed. That's you, isn't it? Oh, it's not you. Oh, no, he looks like you. Sorry. Sorry, wrong guy. That, yeah. Oh, shit. Right. So, two outer sections. Yeah, you all look alike, actually. Right. So, this is the two outer sections, and then we drop the center section in, and can you believe it actually fit? So, so you build, put the trusses up in the air, you cover it with the roof, so the trusses, which are the most important part of the structure, are underneath the roof, they're protected out of the water, and it becomes this kind of beautiful way to access the, the other side of the park. Uh, and people come and fish off it. And there is a handrail now, just so you know, there is a handrail on it. And then we were asked, uh, the locals wanted us to build a 100-foot birding tower to get above the, uh, the cypress swamp, because it's on the major birding trail. And uh, so we tried really hard to build it out of wood. And, and then somebody showed up and said, why don't you just get one of those disused fire towers and, and, and do that? And we're like, oh, shit. OK. So, so within a week, our student team had actually got one for 50 bucks. <laughs> and, and I, of course, I'm in an oh, shit moment. I'm going to have students working 100 foot up in the air. I wouldn't get away with it today, of course. You know. Anyway, we said to the, stu we said to the students, <laughs> I think you get away with it with this guy. He guy, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> well, no, so then we said to the students, OK, what do you want to do? And I, and I said, go find yourself professional training. So they found these guys down on the south coast uh, in Mobile, trained them, and he trained them on the, on the existing tower. And at the end of it, I said, so would you want to do this? And they were like, yeah, let's do it. And two of them, one of them, Natalie, the gal on the third from the right, she works for us at the moment, and she can't believe she ever did it because she's shit scared of heights. So she's like, that was an out-of-body experience. But so we gave them the chance and, and gave them the choice, and they said, yes, we want to do it. So it's actually the safest project we've ever done because there was only four of them could ever be allowed on the project. They took it down piece by piece, uh, they had it regalvanized, then they took it over to the site, and we put it back in the ground with helical anchor foundations that we used the bobcat to drill those helical anchors in 22 feet, four, cor four anchors at four corners, amazing. No concrete trucks, no uh, screwing up of the ecotone, just metal corkscrews. And it's great for uplift and, and lateral stability. So here it is sitting in the site. We didn't need to take any trees down. We built a zigzagging walkway to get there that's also on helical anchors. So the lovely thing about the project, we were most concerned about getting people to the top. So if, you, if you're scared of heights, you can grab hold of the handrail and walk all the way along there, and then grab hold of the handrail at the bottom and cling onto it all the way to the top. <laughs> so if you really shit, I mean, that was it. It's like, we want to get you to here and look down on it. Wow, you know? And we even actually hired an 80-foot scissor lift to go, where are we going to put this? Because like on the ground, you can tell one thing. But if you don't try it up there, how the hell do you know where you're going to put it? So anyway, uh, that encouraged us to take on Lions Park, which was a 10-year just kind of amazing commitment for the community. They came to us in 2000 and asked us to do it. We said, we've never done a multi-year project. In, 2000, in 2005, I said, OK, well, we've tried. We've just done Perry Lakes. Maybe we can. So this is what we found. Uh, and it went through 10 phases. And uh, this is what the local catfish guys and farmers, and this is your client. So you all, this is the fun bit, is talking to fellas that look like that about, what's that? You know, we're going to look. We're going to do a funky backstop for you. Oh, you are? Right. So. So we did, we did all the infrastructure, drainage, entrances. All of these stripes here are utilities that became kind of artful camouflage for utilities. It was a business park that failed, so there's a couple of buildings that existed. But uh, this is the walking trail. Uh, first phase was the ball field, uh, six ball fields, uh, seating, concession stand, restrooms that capture the water off the roof, and then they flush the toilets, tilt up concrete, prison toilets inside, because you think they're going to be durable, and then you figure out that they're actually really fragile, and you're going to be trying to fix them for the rest of your days. Um, uh, lights. Uh, so the, the nice thing is that um, 
all the different teams from across the community are playing out there, not just the kind of uh, baseball teams. Uh, did a concession stand that opens and closes like a mouth. It was really fun because I had a friend of mine who's a plumber. We were trying to build a kind of concession stand with a mouth, and, and we were trying to kind of close it, and Jim showed up and said, why don't you just make it open and shut? And we're like, fuck, you're right. So we just, that thing just closes down onto the, it's, it's really lovely, because then there's just one door and no security issues. Skate park that Tony Hawk sponsored for $20,000. Normally you use $20,000 to have a conversation in the community about a skate park. We built the whole thing for $20,000. Um, uh, uh, playground built of uh, these barrels that um, came from an organizer, a group out of Seattle. They move mint oil across the co country. They're barrels that are made of galvanized. They're, they're actually produced in India. They're shipped to the, this is all perverse, shipped to the west side of the United States filled with mint oil and then moved across to the east side of the United States to be manufactured in toothpaste and, uh, and uh, chewing gum. But they, they then, because of industry standards, destroy all the barrels. So we were given a bunch of them. We were trying to do a maze and we said, and this guy showed up and says, you want some barrels? And we were like, yeah, why not? So we built this maze of barrels. Um, and the kids just go nuts there. On the first night, the opening, we actually had the, a student team playing it, like the Blue Man group. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, uh, Scout Hut built of, uh, you know, waste out of the forest, um, all in the park. And then we got $10,000 from the uh, Department of Public Health for exercise stations and put them underneath the, the canopy of the tree with these different views out. So just a little bit of care. and then. We built all of these shade stations around the park while our trees, we, built, we planted 3,000 trees and while they were growing, we made some sta shade stations. So. so that was quite an adventure. Uh, largest project we ever built, these four guys built uh, the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, you can tell Boys and Girls Club was important because the main dude on the Boys and Girls Club board was the, was the chief of police. So he's like, yep, we, we better do this. And they, it's half the size of a football field. Uh, it's built of sticks and OSB, uh, but incredible. I mean, the kids helped the community raise $170,000 in materials donations for this project. So very entrepreneurial. Uh, uh, more recent stuff, this is uh, multi-unit housing. We've never actually got much into that. Uh, four, this is actually four units sprinkled uh, and will be extended, but we wanted to try four units, let our friends test it out. Um, courtyard for Horseshoe Farm, the same client for the last one, turned this space into this. Uh, really beautiful shaded courtyard. Uh, and then lastly, well, not, not quite lastly, but we started to, you know, in, in our houses evolving, uh, we were really concerned about not understanding what we were wrapping our buildings in and just being encouraged to wrap our buildings with stuff. And uh, we like to call it either cluster, cluster duct or layer cake. And uh, just this stuff that you're told that you need, right? And you don't know where it's coming from. And you can't find out where it's coming from. They just, the industry tells you you should do it. So you're kind of guilted into it. So, so we went on this adventure with a brilliant scientist out of McGill University. His first kind of promise to us was coming up, he came up with this ventilation system for a solid mass timber wall where what he was proposing was to have a heat source inside, a chimney, and drill some holes in the wall. And the idea was that if you drill the holes in the wall, as every architect knows, you, fight, you, you spend your entire life trying to stop the heat loss through the wall, Sal said, well, just let the heat go through the wall and, when the, uh, and we'll drill holes in it and those holes will be drilled far enough or close enough apart that the tributary, when the, sorry, heat's rising, pulls cold air in through the holes in the wall. The tributary area around that cool air coming in through the wall will pick up the heat that's been lost. So he invented this whole kind of ventilation system 
using the fact that buildings leak. Um, and we went through this process uh, using all of, you know, scientific process, being really precise with the heat, try, uh, with, the, with the kind of the, the heat source, and then understanding the kind of issues of buoyancy in, instead of using mechanical sources to move that, that, that air, what happens when you actually use ventil buoyancy ventilation. And so it ended up coming down to, uh, we, at the same time, we would, we would, the idea was that we would test this at large scale, drill some holes in this space, stack the timber, and then drill the holes in the wall. So this is this adventure that we've gone on. Uh, this one is not finished, nor is this one, uh, which is us again uh, testing. This time we're testing thermal mass in these two volumes. Uh, one volume on the left, one on the right. On the one on the right, we covered it with a thin layer of concrete, on the left with wood. And his premise was that if there was a little bit more on, of wood on the left-hand one than on the right concrete, that he could produce the same cooling effect on the inside using wood that was the same as concrete, which we don't normally think of as wood as being a kind of a thermal mass. So this was all taken from uh, studying termite mounds, the diurnal cycle in a termite mound, uh, the air convecting through the space. He, he, he ended up building us uh, an app that we could put all sorts of materials in. And really what this came down to was, was kind of managing the movement of air through the space and through on the diurnal cycle and then the thickness of the material. Because if you imagine when a thermal mass is it is taking on energy in the diurnal cycle, say during the day, that thermal mass can be too big. So it, it might take on a lot of energy and then during the time that it wants to offload that heat into the space, that energy into the space, it doesn't offload it all. So what he was saying is you can actually do it with a very thin layer of concrete. So down the road, the impact of that is you thinking about as architects, what am I cladding the inside of my buildings with that can really help us with the cooling and heating in that space just in the way that it acts. So uh, way too much science, but we ended up building these two things. Um, uh, and the idea is there's a chimney here and a chimney at the bottom, two identical volumes with a cooling porch in here. So when the, 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 the air touches the concrete, it will cool and then it will fall. So there's this kind of visceral effect that you feel from the air being cooled by the concrete inside. So it was really important for us to kind of understand what that visceral, visceral impact was, not just have the science to be able to say it was true. So there's the concrete. What he said was that if you wrap the walls with concrete uh, and then wrap the other, build, the other volume with wood on the ceiling and the floor, the premise is they will act exactly the same and that there'll be the same amount of cooling in that space. So we're right in the middle of testing all of that. So really, I'm close. Uh, last thing about food, you know, I think um, over the last years, we've looked, started to really look at systematic issues, whether it's housing, performance of buildings, we're even it, uh, uh, sort of testing locally uh, issues of wastewater, but food is a major, I mean, we live in a food desert, which seems ridiculous to be in a place like Alabama, surrounded by this lush landscape. Um, most people would drive 10 miles to Piggly Wiggly to buy, you know, pre-packaged processed food. Um, the implications of the industrialization of farming is also the industrialization of food production, which means all our little towns now have McDonald's and you know Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they all start to look the same. And I would argue that that's really a shame. It's also having a major impact on diet. You know, our region is supposed to be 70, 80 percent diabetic within the next 20 years. That's not a problem. That's a fucking disaster for you all, quite frankly. Um, I should make a call out for our three-year-old McDonald's Happy Meal. If anybody want, wants to come to Newburn and have a snack on it, it looks exactly the same as it did three years ago. The French fries smell the same, the burger looks the same, the bread looks the same. Nothing wants to eat it. So you all go off and enjoy your Happy Meal tonight and make yourselves happy, because, I don't know, we're not, we're not fans of McDonald's. 
Um, so here you see the obes obesity issues. So we set up our own farm as a challenge to ourselves. We built ourselves a, a kitchen, a set up a, sort of strategic plan. Uh, so I'm proud to say that today uh, we now grow, we grow our own food from seed. We harvest our food and we all eat together. We built uh, a solar greenhouse using those same barrels. So this extends the growing season for us. And every student that comes to the Royal Studio is involved in the farm. And it has become just part of the culture. And we all eat together. Um, and I think it's been a remarkable learning experience for us all. Uh, you can see the front yard. And we do a no-till practice, which is essentially we will, uh, in the off-season, we'll grow cover crops. And then we tarp over them, let it die. And it's a natural process. Instead of tilling the land, unlike nature. If you till it, it encourages weeds. And nature is smart and doesn't till it, you know? So um, probably the biggest impact that had at the time was Greensboro realized they didn't have a place for the local farmers to um, display their wares. And so we were asked by uh, the same uh, guy, uh, Steve Gentry, that you spoke about earlier to, to do a farmer's market. So we built these. Uh, we built these little movable farmer's market stalls. I think I can do it. Or maybe, did it start? There you go. So this is, this is Rural Studio High Tech, right? There's no music. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and it, it's a piece of the, the, it was predicted that essentially the farmer's market would be squatting. So you need to move it on a wrecking truck and you might have to move it a lot. And uh, so they're just on skids, and then they open up like this. And it, at the time, it had its, it, its issues with the farm at the moment, but it had an amazing effect in our community, allowing people access to fresh vegetables. So um, I think I'm about done. Uh, you know, tonight, think about what you're eating. Eat catfish from West Alabama. Don't eat the shit on the left. Uh, and if you want to, in two and a half weeks' time, we have a big old party in our amphitheater, it's quite kind of mystical. Um, Jed might tell you it's pretty, pretty fabulous. And we have a band, and we spend God knows how much money on fireworks, and drink a lot of beer, and, and a lot, eat a lot of catfish and a lot of pig. So anyway, you're all welcome to come, because we like visitors. So thank you all. I'll shut up. So.